thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our research. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, let you know that we are a team of mathematicians and archaeologists that are seeking ways to use differential geometry to improve archaeological methods. And we have two of our other team members here. We have uh, Dr. Peter Olver right there, um, who is our senior mathematician on the project, who you may have heard speak yesterday about using differential geometry for the purpose of uh, differentiating actors of bone breakage. And then we have Dr. Reed Coyle right behind him there, uh, who is a fellow archaeologist and taphonomist. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about how to, well, our initial preliminary efforts to try and find a way to use differential geometry to create a method for automated refit of faunal remains. We're focusing on long bone fragments. All right, so refits and the spatial analysis of refits, as many of you know, are really important uh, in zooarchaeological research. And they can be used to, to address questions like, um, hominin uh, evolution, behavior, hominin and carnivore interactions, site use patterns, uh, site reconstruction. Uh, we can also test stratigraphic integrity, or we can identify more of our specimens by joining unidentifiable specimens to identifiable specimens. So uh, we can get at some really interesting anthropological inquiries. However, <laughs> it's a pain. It's really hard. <laughs> so, um, and so unfortunately, it is oftentimes neglected, even though it's considered crucial and necessary for um, zooarchaeological analysis. So what could help us? Well, before I get to that, let me also address the logistics. Sorry. So we all know that the bigger the assemblage, the harder it's going to be, the more time expensive, cost expensive, right? But also, there's just managing it, right? You can only hold so many fragments, so if you want to refit more than the fragments that you can hold, you're going to have to consider adhesives. Well, adhesives can damage the break surfaces, and not only that, um, it, the pieces are now glued together, so you can't do further research on those surfaces. So, so automatic refits of 3D models of these fragments would be ideal. So the question is, can we do this? Can we create a method that is automated, that is efficient, that is reliable, um, that doesn't require us to have a priori knowledge of the sample, and can be done within reasonable bounds on scan resolution. So we have seen virtual anthropology being used to reconstruct uh, skeletal remains. So we have the pelvis of Artipithecus ramidus, and we have the cranium of Sahelanthropus chadensis and OH5, and there are more. And however, these require a tremendous amount of uh, user interface. People are going to have to um, be working with the software quite extensively. And so this is really impractical if you're talking about 10,000 fragments. That would be daunting. So pottery, there's been some research in automatic refits using pottery. Uh, however, the parameters that are used are things like surface roughness or um, axial symmetry or uh, predictable break patterns based on the flatness or the spherical shape of the pottery. Um, and then with figurines like this, you have much more distinctive fragments than you would find in, say, a long bone shaft frag. So that's not really useful for skeletal material. Um, the PRISM project at Arizona State had a pilot study they were, where they looked at refitting lithics, but it's unclear if that culminated into a larger body of work. Um, and then we have refitting such as these. We have this uh, map of 3rd century Rome, I believe, um, Kohler et al., they put together this marble map, but they used the, the image of the map to put it together, so the picture, essentially, that the inscription made. This is some really interesting work by um, Papa Odysseus and colleagues where they took uh, this um, wall painting and, that was fragmented and they put it together by taking an image of the fragments and then they made the images black and the backgrounds white, so there was high contrast, and then they looked at the contours around the fragments, and what they were doing was trying to minimize the distance between those contours. And what's interesting about that approach is that it takes into consideration that edges can be damaged and you can be missing pieces. So you're not necessarily looking for an exact match, but you're looking for a likely match based on um, reduction of distance between contours. So mathematicians like to try to solve puzzles automatically as well, right? And so 
Uh, a lot of their algorithms, however, require that you have a surface image. Um, or the, the workflow puts together the outside of the puzzle and then fills it in, which assumes that you have most of your pu puzzle pieces and that you have outside pieces and um, not ideal for both. Uh, many of the algorithms require that you have a priori knowledge of the end shape of the puzzle after it's been refit. And they work better, perform better if the puzzle pieces themselves are um, regular or uniform in shape. So this is where Dr. Olver's work comes in to play. So in 2014, I believe it was, he and a colleague of his, Dr. Hopp, created this uh, piece locking algorithm that uses differential geometry based on signature curves to, um, to refit these puzzle pieces. That, and, and their method doesn't require that you have a picture, and it doesn't require that you have a priori knowledge of the shape of the puzzle. And then they extended this work to refit um, an ostrich egg, a broken ostrich egg. So the edges of those fragments were curved that could then be subdivided. And then um, matches could be found based on their signature curve. So this is much more promising. Right? So then the question is, how do, we, how do we do this with bone, though? How do we do this when we have surfaces and curves, essentially? So well, we need a puzzle. So we break bones a lot of different ways. This one happens to be an elk femur that was broken by Scruffy, the spotted hyena at the Milwaukee County Zoo. We love Scruffy, super cute. <laughs> don't worry, I have self-control. <laughs> I don't try to pet him. Um, all right, so, <laughs> but I want to. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so Scruffy. So we took this fragmented bone and we scanned it using a David white light scanner. And then I used uh, Geomagic Design X to refit the fragments. Okay, so this is our puzzle we're going to try to do automatically. All right. So again, issues that we confront working with skeletal materials. No picture. We're missing pieces. So obviously Scruffy really enjoyed the proximal end of this femur. And uh, we're missing some other pieces as well. So because of this, we don't really have knowledge of what the end shape is going to be because it's certainly not going to look like an intact femur. Sometimes we have those end-to-end -end fits. I don't know how many zooarchaeologists we have, but when you fit, two, it fit, you fit two fragments together and they have that like locking feeling and it feels so good and you feel accomplished. Yeah, and then you have these. All right, so these are harder refits, right? So you have your, your fragment that has a really nice, acute edge that a computer algorithm could quite easily detect. However, the edge that it attaches to is a lot more subtle. And so the same algorithm might have difficulty detecting that edge. And then um, trabecular bone, right? That's going to obscure the edge, make it difficult to detect. And then we have this issue that one break surface can connect to more than one break surface. So this highlights the fact that we need a semi-localized method that allows us to subdivide the curves, subdivide the faces, to, so that we can have a scenario of one-to-one um, -one matching. All right, so to that end, I colored in some fragments, uh, did a little digital zoo archaeology training with mathematicians, like this is how you segment a fragment. And then they said, no, this is how you segment a fragment. So they took, there's the model right here, and then they used a standard algorithm that um, many people use in this field to segment the fragment there and then to de detect the edge. Theirs took less time. Yeah, that was nice. OK, so if you can detect the edges, that makes life easier in terms of segmenting your fragment because you've literally outlined all your faces, right? So that's one way to segment the fragment, is to use edge detection. The other way, so again, remember I talked about fragments that aren't so easy to detect. Well, then how do you segment it? One method would be to use spectral clustering. So how this works is that you look at a localized region on the surface of your fragment, and you look at all the vertices within that region, and you compare their normals. And if they exceed a certain threshold, then you know they're not pointing the same way then you would assign those vertices to different faces. Okay. Another way that you can trace edges is by, well, an edge tracing algorithm. And so the, how this works is that it finds the shortest distance between two points. But we're not talking about Euclidean distances. We're talking about the shortest. The distance is, is inversely weighted by the curvature. So the algorithm is going to look for points of high curvature. 
Now, something that we're working on that I find really exciting and magical is that usually you have to define the starting point, right, and the end point, and then the algorithm finds the proper path to, between, those to, to the, between those two points. However, I don't know about you, but I don't want to try and tell it where to put these points um, 10,000 times over. And if we have some sort of mathematical um, definition of where to put those points, it might not work for every variant, right? So we're, we're actually trying to figure out how to do this. It's pretty exciting. One of our team members is, is going to try and figure out how to fully automate it so you can run all the fragments through and the computer will decide where these points need to be. So I'm, I'm excited to see that unfold. All right, so the big, pro oh, the big problem of segmentation. So then we have um, face matching and curve matching. So again, this 2D model, you take an outline of the fragment, you subdivide it, and based on the signature curves, you can match it, and then you can begin to put the puzzle pieces together. And so this is also something that we're trying to extrapolate to surfaces. And so here we had our first match of surfaces. Obviously, it didn't work very well. It's because we used a distance algorithm, and the fracture edge that extended beyond on the pink really confused it, so it couldn't do it well. So we're looking at other methods particularly the cylinder volume method. The cylinder volume method is taking a cylinder and putting it um, perpendicular to the surfaces all right, that we're interested in looking at. And so the region that we're interested in is inside the cylinder, and then you want to try and minimize the volume. And if you do a good job of this, then you have a good indication that you have a match. Um, so this is really new. This is inspired by the Papodiceus work that I talked about a minute ago, um, and really preliminary, so keep your eyes open. All right, so moving forward, well, we have to figure out how to automatically refit an elk femur that's been chewed by a hyena. Then from there, we need to increase the number of fragments, increase the number of taxa, methods of breakage, skeletal elements, because all of those are going to increase the variability. And then the exciting thing is to apply this to an archaeological sample, because we need to know that it's going to work on something that has an extensive taphonomic history. To that end, we're going to scan the fragments at Dimenisi and try to put them together. Okay? So with that, I'd like to acknowledge our entire bone breakage team in that first bullet point and all the other individuals that have been moving this project forward. And thank you.